speaking on behalf of the school, we're really grateful to be able to host this panel and concert with our colleagues at CABS. As many of you know, both Rare Book School and CABS offer week-long educational programs that have been interrupted by the coronavirus pandemic, which has had a transformative effect on many of our lives and our, and our businesses and on our institutions. The following discussion is part of a larger series of conversations that we're hosting at Rare Book School in lieu of our usual summer programming. We envision the following conversation as being not about definitive answers, but rather about choices and perspectives that we are all weighing during the current moment as we each adapt to the unique challenges presented by the pandemic. Our hope is that this dialogue will benefit all concerned and will help draw attention to various gains and losses presently at stake. Hello, uh, my name is Maria Lin and I'll be co-moderating this panel with Barbara. I work for Rulon Miller Books and I teach at CAS Minnesota. In putting together this panel, we've attempted to include a range of perspectives and experience. Our panelists include Clinton Fluker of the Atlanta University Center Robert W. Woodruff Library, Victoria Fosberg Larry of Seller Story book, uh, Bookstore, Heather O'Donnell of Honey and Wax Booksellers, Catherine Reagan of the Division of Rare and Manuscript Collections at Cornell University, and my boss, Rob Rulon Miller of Rulon Miller Books. Our panelists will be exploring six questions that Barbara and I have prepared for them before we open up the conversation to live Q&A. Uh, because this portion of the session is being recorded, we request that you turn off your video feeds during the initial portion of the meeting. At 5 p.m., we will stop recording the session and we'll open up the conversation to live Q&A. At that later time, we'll be taking questions via Zoom's raise hand feature and we'll be taking questions via Zoom's chat. We ask that all participants maintain a respectful dialogue in keeping with RBS's code of conduct. Great, thanks Maria. Okay, so we're gonna kick off our panel discussion with the first question. So it appears that both the book trade and institutional collections are entering into a period of extreme financial uncertainty at a time when many individuals and families are experiencing the terror of illness and the loss of loved ones. How has this affected your business or institution over the past several weeks? And what preparations are you making for the immediate future? How about the long-term future? I'm turning it over to the panel. And um, if you wish to reply, please unmute yourself. That's me, Rob. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you, Rob. Great. Uh, well, the first thing I would say is that uh, financial uncertainty is sort of part and par parcel of being a bookseller. Uh, I, we've all experienced it, and uh, while this may be a little bit uh, more severe than usual, uh, it's not uncommon in the book trade at all. Uh, my sales, we did a ransom numbers yesterday, my sales over the last two months from the middle of March to the middle of May are down about 40%. Uh, and um, uh, we have a lot of backlog here that we're catching up on. We've, uh, during the six weeks that I was alone in the house, I cataloged about 475 books. And uh, there are also collections that I've been putting together over the, my career, actually, for a long time. And we're beginning to catalog those too in case uh, things really get bad. But uh, anyway, I think uh, uh, we're all, we're all going to get through this, and I'm pretty optimistic about it. Great. Thanks, Rob. Heather, um, do you want to follow up on what Rob was saying and tell us about how your business is doing? Sure. Um, well, so I, too, am working almost entirely from home now, and for me, too, sales are way, way down. Um, there's a slight uptick in online sales, but typically very cheap things. So it's not super helpful. Um, although, of course, I'm grateful for whatever can happen. Um, you know, in terms of um, what my strategy is, I've been doing a lot of small flips, um, you know, handling material that I wouldn't ordinarily handle, but feel like now I don't have the luxury to turn things down. So sourcing books for people um, that are a little bit outside, Honey and Wax's usual wheelhouse. I also applied for a, a paycheck protection loan. Uh, which uh, was approved this week. So there'll be some cash coming in here to sort of cover, you know, rent and salary for a couple of months. Um, and I think that's a short-term strategy that a lot of booksellers are turning to. Um, 
so yeah, that's, uh, you know, that's what I'm doing, dealing with back stock, cataloging, trying to get stuff online. Um, we'll be talking a little bit later about the virtual book fairs that are coming up in June. So I think a lot of us are sort of looking ahead to that and using that as the deadline to get some things done in the absence of the usual events that would be, you know, are giving a pace to our, to our work. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what it's been like at Honey and Wax. We're not on, you know, we're in no danger, but it's definitely not been, uh, you know, business as usual here. Thanks, Heather. Uh, what about you, Victoria? How's everything at Seller Books? Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, and, and Seller Stories, uh, bookstore, yes. right. Um, the things are obviously very different because we're used to being open at six or seven days a week and we're not. Um, but similarly, we've, we've seen an uptick in online sales, so that's been pretty steady. Um, and like I said, we're no stranger to uh, struggling a bit. Um, we're, we're pretty used to that. Pretty much every January through April is our, our slow period anyways. So um, definitely March was a bit slower than usual. But I mean, other than that, it hasn't been a drastic change. Um, usually we do plan for a spring sale in April and then it starts to kind of pick up our summer business, which we're kind of you know, not planning on this year. So we're going to have to um, make some changes. We've done um, like, you know, trying to get rid of some of our, our in-store stock that's not cataloged online, doing like a mystery box of books for $20. And, you know, just like Heather said, just small flips, you know, trying to move any stock at all really is, is good. You know, anything is better than nothing. So we'll take it. Thanks, Victoria. Um, Let's hear from our curators um, so that we can hear about what the institutional side is like. Um, Catherine, do you want to tell us what's going on at Cornell? Yeah, sure. Um, so Cornell Library staff are all still working remotely. Um, and while we're temporarily paused with purchasing of physical materials, um, what I'm hearing from, from both um, librarians at Cornell and peers nationally is that we're nonetheless juggling a full roster of work. Um, we're, we're working on supporting remote teaching, research, reference, outreach, instruction, all the IT systems behind those programs, or engaged in, in work on cataloging and metadata cleanup and processing backlogs. I think it sounds like both institutions and booksellers are taking advantage of, of backlog and cataloging projects. Um, or we're writing grants or reconfiguring services or attending endless planning and administrative meetings to prepare for reopening work safely. And I, I think a lot of us share those activities in common. Um, higher education is deep in analysis mode, as I'm sure everyone knows, um, trying to figure out when faculty and staff can return to campus and how extensively we will rely on remote teaching in the coming academic year. Um, so I think we're all learning together that uncertainty is pretty hard work. What we do know is that jobs in university libraries next year will center around ensuring academic continuity, making sure that uh, our teaching needs are supported even if those activities are remote and that students and faculty have course materials and reserve and research access even if that's digital. So our work is, is pretty much um, laser focused on that right now. And, you know, as Rob was saying earlier that we've, you know, multi many of us have lived through multiple downturns. I'm optimistic about the long-term horizon, but, um, you know, for, for the short term, it's going to be grim. Cornell um, scenario planning is underway for what budget cuts of five, 10 or 20% would look like. So I guess we're, we're going to need to be resilient and rely on each other and learn as much as we can from this experience to to emerge stronger on the other side. Gosh, thanks, Catherine. Um, very sobering news. Clint, um, tell us about what's going on at the Woodruff Library. Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, similar to what Catherine was saying, uh, we have a uh, a really interesting setup. There's some uh, aspects of uh, COVID-19 that are affecting us negatively, but 
um, and I'll speak to those, but there's also some, uh, some positive things to take away from it. Um, namely that since we are working remotely and things are all digital, um, I think that the AUC Woodruff Library has discovered that we really have quite a lot of capacity as a, um, a digital uh, resource for students and professors. And we have a different setup than your, your, um, your normal university system. Um, our library serves four different schools, four different historically black, black colleges and universities. And so we are really doing our best to, uh, like Catherine said, go through the backlog, uh, digitize materials, uh, well not digitize materials, take materials that are already digital <laughs> and then make them accessible. Um, we're doing a lot more instruction um, with uh, the various uh, schools, uh, the different uh, research methods that people need, digital humanities projects. Um, we, we're experiencing with our numbers an increase in engagement with the library in, in many different aspects. So that's great. It allows us to showcase our materials um, in a new light. Um, there are the obvious downturns for uh, curators, um, namely um, we had several symposiums and um, uh, large scale projects that were on the horizon um, right when um, uh, the COVID-19 crisis really hit. And so uh, these symposiums are often, for us at least, focused on highlighting special collections. And so you lose that opportunity to not only um, celebrate uh, the donors who've given you those collections, um, but also uh, you lose that opportunity to share that as a research, uh, research uh, resource and to, uh, you know, get new donors. <laughs> so uh, that's, a, that's a really important uh, um, aspect of what's happened thus far. Um, but again, I think that we've discovered uh, in the long term that we'll, we have a, a lane in the AUC Woodruff Library of this digital capacity that uh, perhaps the rest of the schools weren't aware of, and we're, we're more than willing and able to, uh, to keep moving in that direction. Great. Thank you very much. Um, Maria, over to you. Question two. So question two. In the book trade, the most recent analogs to the current crisis would appear to be the period directly after 9-11, and the global economic downturn of 2008. The first of these was dramatic in its impact, but relatively short-lived. The second had a depressive effect on the trade over a number of years. Um, do our panelists have a sense yet of how the current crisis relates to these earlier ones? And have you developed any strategies for the immediate future based on your experiences with these other events? You want to take it, Rob? Sure. Happy to, Maria. Thank you. Am I okay? Yes. Uh, well, you know, I sort of see this as just another crisis, and uh, there have been a lot of them in my career. I remember starting uh, before there were computers, and when the computer came around, man, that was a big crisis, and I'm still working on that one. Uh, so um, anyway, uh, I'm just, uh, you know, we're going to try the virtual book fair, see if that's going to work for us. Uh, we're going to cut expenses where, where we can um, and uh, just keep my nose to the grindstone, really, uh, cataloging books and getting them out there. Uh, I'm not really sure what else I can say to that. Um, Heather, do you have anything to add? Well, I would say that I wasn't in the book trade full time during 9-11, so I don't have anything to add there. But um, I did weather the 2008 downturn as a bookseller at Bowman Rare Books on Madison Avenue, which was kind of right at the center of the financial crash and the, the resultant uh, chaos among private collectors. And, uh, and I remember that period very well. And I certainly remember uh, a lot of uh, financiers coming in with books they had bought with their bonuses in a couple of years previous, wondering if they could possibly consign them back now that <laughs> they were going bankrupt. Um, you know, and, and we, you know, we weathered that. We all stayed employed, we, uh, just, you know, tightened, tightened up. I mean, what makes this crisis seem different, of course, is that is the viral component. Right. I mean, it's the fact that it's actually dangerous for large groups of people to be together in close quarters. And that means that until there's a vaccine, a lot of the 
rituals that we in the book trade and the library world rely upon for our conferences and our events and our symposia, our rare book school, cabs, book fairs, um, all seem at present just paused indefinitely. It's not clear that even when those are able to reopen legally, that people are gonna wanna come in the same way. Um, and that to me is, is really the, the thing that distinguishes this from a, you know, a, a market downturn or something like that. Like it actually changes the way we're all relating to other people and to space. And that I think is unprecedented, at least for me. Um, Victoria, you weren't in the trade uh, in 2008, right? Correct. Um, I started working um, so you you like me, you're a millennial. Do you have any um, perspective as someone who's sort of coming into this uh, as this, your uh, first crisis? Right. It is. It's my first crisis um, at the reins, I guess. Um, I did, I started here in 2014 and you could still see the after effects of 2008. Um, I mean, for starters, I was his sole employee when he hired me, the owner of the store in 2014. And uh, prior to 2008, he had always had three to five people on staff. So, uh, you know, right off the bat, I could tell it was different than it used to be. Um, he was very pessimistic all the time. I mean, um, he was very supportive of me entering the trade, but he was, you know, um, always very vocal about, um, you know, the fact that I was probably going to be poor for the rest of my life and it was going to be a struggle if I wanted to be in this. So really until I went to CAB last summer, I had only seen um, pessimism for the book trade. Um, and not that this is a a great time to be, you know, running a bookstore. Obviously, it's uh, definitely strange, but I will say it's kind of cool to get to try out all these different ways of book selling, a lot of which I just learned about last summer at Cabs for the first time and figured, oh, maybe years down the road I'll get to try that out. And now I'm kind of in this unique, you know, very strange position where I can try opening by appointment or just selling online or, you know, I can take the time to devote to these kind of projects and try it out and see what works, I guess. So that's kind of just been my mindset so far. Thank you. Um, so for Catherine and Clinton, I know um, the 2008 recession also had some serious impacts on things like funding and um, hiring in the library space. Do you anticipate uh, something like that happening again, or is it just going to accelerate the trend, or what do you think? Yeah, I think we're heading into another um, pretty grim era. I did live through 9-11 in 2008 as a curator, um, and what I learned during those times is that there will be an eventual recovery, but um, this one is just harder to see. Um, Heather mentioned that it's, it's really not just about the economy. There are a bunch of broader effects. And um, I think that um, what we're going to see is that when we do come back, there will have been cultural shifts that we can't um, fully predict either. But it's hard to see fewer than two to four years of austerity ahead for higher education at minimum. And um, what I learned in previous downturns is that buying will continue at institutions. It's just that it will continue um, in some cases with smaller budgets and maybe with a little bit shift in criteria. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see how we can build on these virtual communities um, that we're only just now starting to see launch to continue to, to support each other. The, the book world is all inter interconnected um, and I think we're going to learn a lot um, through this crisis, through these new tools that we develop so that when we do come out of it, maybe we'll have more options and those options will in fact make it easier to connect more people to the trade and, and not fewer. Um, although, you know, it, it's, I can't imagine it's not going to be rough for a while. And, uh, Quentin, do you have anything to add? 
Yeah, I'll, I'll say that I too am a millennial on this panel. So uh, I believe I just started high school in 9-11 and I graduated college in 2008. So uh, like the, the same age, yeah, the, the feeling of having no job opportunity as you leave, I, I'm familiar with that. <laughs> yeah. um, but the, uh, the, I think that there are a couple things that are important uh, to note. So uh, I do know the history of the um, AUC Woodruff Library um, around 2008 was one where there was a lot of tightening of funds, which is what's going on now and how we spend. And uh, the library was able to make it through. Um, and really what has come out of that um, is uh, a library that is far uh, better prepared for this kind of thing um, than what might have happened before. Um, I was a student at Morehouse College, which is a, um, a partner institution uh, for this library. Um, and the effects of the financial crisis uh, are still felt amongst HBCUs for sure. Um, so, you know, the, you might be, you know, eight years removed, 10 years removed, 12 years removed, but it doesn't matter. It's like you still feel it. <laughs> um, so this is compounding in that regard. Um, so I see us tightening some things. But strategies that I believe we've used beyond the financial um, and what we've, we've started to do with our um, colleagues and staff is really focus on uh, the mental health of everyone, uh, making sure that they are aware of the Morehouse School of Medicine, um, which is right next door to us, um, providing services. Um, also, we really still focus on professional development so that uh, even though if you're like at the house and, you know, trying to do your, your best work, you still feel like you're moving towards something. Um, I think that's very important. Um, and uh, the, the check-ins that we have with staff and colleagues are certainly more uh, than they would have been if it was just at, um, uh, you know, a, a regular work day or a regular work week. But they're not only about just checking up to make sure the tasks are done. You know, it's, it's really making sure that uh, people are, are feeling comfortable uh, to continue doing work uh, generally. Um, so we're, we're implementing some strategies around that, uh, which I think is really helpful. Um, and so we'll see, we'll see where this goes. Uh, I, I too think that the most important uh, theme that I can identify is uncertainty. <laughs> <laughs> is is where where we are each week I come in and I'm just waiting to hear what what we're going to do um so uh that's the most I can I can say about it um, from my millennial perspective great thank you thank you Barbara yeah um so this question um is going to delve into this social aspect that a number of you were getting at the current pandemic has in some ways shaken us for, from our usual patterns of work. Um, for many dealers and collectors, institutional as well as private, trade is not only about financial transactions, but also about camaraderie and social activity. Book fairs stand out as one of the many activities that bring us together. What do you think about the future of in-person book fairs, as well as the kinds of virtual book fairs that are appearing now? And what are some of the opportunities that we have in the present moment to form new kinds of relationships with dealers, collectors, and curators, and to reach out to newcomers who want to learn more about the kinds of materials that we work with? Uh, Rob, do you want to kick it off? Yeah, happy to. Thanks, Barbara. Uh, well, I think, you know, book fairs are really a lot of fun. And we're not going to want to uh, give those up for very long. I, you know, a vaccine comes around. I think that's going to help a lot. Um, and I think that uh, there's just too much uh, personal interaction that goes on there between dealers, between dealers and customers and uh, librarians. Uh, we just can't be without that for long. And we're going to find, we're going to get back there as quickly as we can uh, and as safely as we can, I think. Um, but it's going to take a couple of years. I think, you know, the Boston Book Fair is probably in jeopardy. I think uh, the California Book Fairs uh, next February are in jeopardy. Uh, even New York next spring. Um, but uh, they will be back. Um, what am I doing differently to contact people? Well, I never like contacting people too much anyway, so uh, I can't, uh, you know, I get in touch with my dealer friends and a few, a few librarians, but... Um, you know, we just do what we can do and keep going. Will you be showing at the ABA A Fair in June? Yes. The virtual fair? See what happens. Yep. 
Heather, what about you? Um, well, I'm signed up for the ABA fair in June and also for Marvin Getman's fair, which is going to be the first week of June too. Um, you know, everybody is, uh, I mean, we've just saw um, Iowa did their fair this past week. Uh, the Paris fair, which was canceled in person, did a kind of online version. Um, everyone's trying. And I feel like as someone who does not think that the physical social aspect of the of the real book fair can ever really be replaced virtually. Of course, I'm skeptical, but I also feel like this is an opportunity for us to learn things and we should be throwing ourselves into it and not so harsh on, you know, people's first tries to put this kind of thing together. Um, you know, it's going to take a while to come up with a virtual book fair that is going to be good for everyone involved. And I think we just have to be real about that and do our best, continue to contribute, continue to support, see what we can learn from this. The truth is that scouting books at a book fair and scouting books online are two totally different skill sets. And all dealers have those both skill sets to some degree, but some are much better at one than the other. Right now, I feel almost like, for me, I mean, for the past two months, I haven't been in a room full of books that I didn't personally buy. And that is a lifetime record. And it is awful. I hate it. Um, I hate buying online every day and never getting to go look at a collection or make a house call or visit a shop or visit another dealer. Um, that it's, it's a real loss to me. Um, but at the same time, there's nothing to be done about it. So I'm trying to get better at online scouting, develop that skill set more than it has been. Um, it feels a little bit like if you were obsessively working out like one arm. You know, it's not balanced and it's not healthy. And long term, you should not be doing that. But at present, like it's the only arm I can exercise. So I'm like trying to make it, make it stronger. Um, you know, in terms of uh, reaching out to people, I mean, one thing that has been kind of nice about this whole Zoom lifestyle that we're currently living, um, you know, is that I've been tuning into a lot of things that I would never actually go to in real life because it would be like half a day and like I don't have time for that but like you know I went to Amy Hildreth Chen's BSA webinar yesterday which was really fascinating. Holly Phillips did something with the Met last week on like American publishers bindings. Like it's a real opportunity to see the work of people that you admire like see them kind of in their element doing stuff and that has been actually kind of a fun thing that probably won't continue once we all go back to normal life because we'll all have actual jobs that we have to be doing and won't have time but for someone who's you know quarantined with a teenager and a cat, the, the pleasure of seeing my colleagues doing things and talking about their work is a really great one. So I've been, been grateful for that during this period anyhow. Thanks, Heather. Uh, Victoria, do you wanna to speak to, to uh, this issue? Hi, yes. Uh, we don't normally participate in book fairs. So um, the book fair aspect of it doesn't actually affect us. Um, however, we're an open shop, so the losing the sense of community and camaraderie definitely does, and that's, you know, a huge part of our business. Um, a lot of the behind-the-scenes things that happen at our, our store are, you know, just happen through friends of the store. Our packing supplies are all recycled, you know. People bring them into us. Um, our advertisements that we publish, someone that we know just does them for fun because he likes our bookstore, you know, and it's, it's very apparent to me that we wouldn't have such a strong support system if we didn't have an actual brick and mortar store. You know, everyone that comes in the door comments on the smell of the old books and, you know, the, the things they get to see and the things they look at. And it, if you, you know, we wouldn't have that if we didn't have an open shop. So it's definitely uh, something to to and then you know it's going to take a while to figure out I think eventually we will start opening by appointment because you know like Heather said it's just it's, book buying is such a tactile experience and you're really missing out on a huge part of it by not being able to you know touch and smell and look at every book you want to buy so um, hopefully we'll be able to kind of work that in eventually but yeah um, it's been interesting kind of trying to figure out how to work around that one. Thanks, Victoria. Catherine, do you want to speak to in-person fairs and also the kinds of opportunities that you see? Um, you alluded to that earlier, opportunities for newcomers to um, 
possibly uh, learn about these communities, to join the communities? Uh, what do you see? Yeah, I think um, I've, I've tried to keep my spirits up by being really encouraged by how fast everyone's been able to adapt. Um, you know, the, this crisis came on so fast and its effect has been so broad, but it's been really heartening to see how quickly the trade has responded with creativity and the launch of things like virtual fairs or even the more frequent collaboration projects I'm seeing on jointly issued catalogs. I noticed, Heather, you did one of those. Um, and, um, you know, I think cultural heritage repositories are doing the same. They're, they're working on refuting misconceptions that we can, that we cannot res serve research, teaching, and public engagement without direct hands-on access to our physical collections. We, we clearly can do that. Um, at the same time, a, another lesson has been that virtual experiences are definitely poor substitutes for real ones. There's, there's no way of getting around that. And after a year of this, I'm hoping that um, we can predict that there's going to be a huge pent up longing for in-person interactions that will follow, including at book fairs. Um, but until that becomes safe again, I do, I do see a lot of opportunities for learning. Um, you know, the pandemic as a driver of increasingly creative responses and tools I think we're only really just the beginning of seeing the efforts and how they're going to pay off. I mean, if you can pull together, if you can invent virtual book fairs in five weeks, think, think of what we're gonna be able to do in five months in terms of getting better at this. Um, so, you know, this types of online programming that we're starting to see, whether it's virtual fairs or more blogs and podcasts or new open content or educational activities moving online, all of that stuff, you know, it does not have the cost barriers or the time barriers of physical place-bound activities. And I do hope that people interested in learning more about our fields while they're stuck at home will feel welcome and encouraged and more connected and also financially more able to, to connect with some of these opportunities. Thanks, Catherine. And Clint, you were talking before about the library seeing increased access. Um, do you want to um, say a little bit more about that and opportunities that you see for this kind of um, outreach. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about that later, but particularly with respect to camaraderie and bringing newcomers in. Yeah, I think that for, for our main constituency, when it, uh, when you talk about the students and the professors, it's been uh, very positive in that in certain aspects of how people interact with us they've just gone up like the numbers are are uh, the digital numbers that were that we had before we're seeing a huge uh uh difference and so i'm i'm happy by, about that and I, I look forward to how that can continue once we get back into uh you know like what we can see as normal or some version of normal um because the digital offerings are not just about getting access to the material it's about forming new ways of learning it's about forming new ways of uh, pedagogy and research and so i think that that's that's a good thing it's uh piggybacking off of what heather said you know it's like you're working out a different arm um and when uh anytime you can do that i think that's a it's a good thing uh as it pertains to the uh buying and selling of materials uh like the fairs are great. The digital fairs, virtual fairs are, are a good thing. We should encourage it. We should go to it. Um, and I think that it'll be great for existing relationships in some regards. It's like my relationships with dealers that I know, if I can see them there, you know, showcasing stuff, that'll be a great thing. And you're like, oh, okay, so what, they, what do they have? You know, that's excellent. What you lose in um, many cases as a curator, and I think uh, any curator would say this, is that the relationship is everything. You know, it's like your relationship with the dealer, your relationship with the donors. It's about meeting people and discussing the materials with each other um, and forming this bond. Um, and that's how you learn about new things. Um, and it's also how you can trust somebody across virtual lines <laughs> when they say they have something. <laughs> it's like, okay, great. I, I trust this person. Um, and so at the virtual uh, fairs, I, I think about it in those, with those two approaches. There's the existing relationships, and that's great. I'm curious how to form new relationships um, 
and I'm, I think the physical um, interaction is something that we can't ever um, overestimate or it is something we need rather. Can I just follow up on, on what Clint just said? Sure. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I got uh, a call from a curator uh, who I had talked to at the New York Fair, uh, who said, you know, we still have a little bit of our budget for the year and the staff all met over Zoom and we've decided we want to spend this with dealers that we really want to see on the other side of this, people whose work we admire. And so, you know, we have a few things on your site that we're interested in. And I was incredibly moved by that. And I, you know, really was grateful for the, the support. And that it was coming from a place of wanting to maintain, you know, people in the trade that, that they hope to see, um, you know, come through this whole thing. Um, but it also made me really aware of like, what if you were, a, a new dealer who hadn't had the opportunity to make that impression on a curator. Like, I do actually think that my relationships with curators are pretty solid. Like, if they're not buying, it's not because they, you know, don't like me. It's just because they don't have the budget now and, you know, I don't have exactly the right thing, but they'll come back. They'll, they'll continue to pay attention. It's the people who aren't getting paid attention to that I feel like right now it's really tricky because no one can really see their stuff and you don't necessarily want to buy something expensive if you have no sense of what's behind that. Uh, and so I think, I think that is gonna be a huge challenge for the trade, is how do we help people at a, at a fledgling point make it through this difficult crunch? Yeah, thanks Heather. And we're gonna, um, we're gonna mention, come back to that um, as part of question six and explore some ways that we can, we can help. I'm turning it over to Maria, um, who is gonna kick it off with, um, a poll that we're launching that talks more about institutional funding, which is all of you can see is a big, um, a big issue. Um, Maria, do you want to say anything before I launch the poll? Um, sure. So this poll is going to pop up on your screens and you can uh, pick the option that is most relevant to your situation. There's also a NA for those of us who are not um, members of any institutions. And uh, the question I'm going to be asking is, uh, sort of aimed towards the librarians on the panel. So uh, we've been seeing um, that some institutions are freezing their collections, acquiring or freezing their funding. And um, we're interested in hearing about what the long-term cost of suspending this activity may be. And if there are any precedents or cautionary tales from the past that um, anyone would like to share. So we're gonna open this up actually with Clint, if you're willing. Oh, Got to unmute first, though. I'm sorry. Could you? I, all that was broken up for me. Oh, I'm so sorry. sorry. <laughs> so um, we were asking about uh, the freezing of institutional buying uh, at this point. Mm -hmm. So what you think the long-term costs of these sort of decisions might be, and if there's any precedent for it that you're aware of. Yeah. So. Um, so in the in the negative sense, I think uh, in one regard, it slows down the development of certain um, special collections um, because we're not buying it um, to the extent that we would usually. Um, and so I, I think, for example, of one special collection that's very important to me is the Black uh, comic book a collection that we started a while ago. Uh, we just uh, earlier in the year had acquired uh, almost an entire full run of milestone comics from the 90s i'm geeking out over here guys i'm sorry i can't help it um but it's you know it, it's a it's a great collection and there's just a few more left <laughs> and before you uh begin uh, uh advertising what you have and putting it out um exhibiting it and making it available for research and the like you just really want to complete that kind of thing and you know we're at a place now where we just can't can't do that um and uh, that goes follows back into the fairs. You know, it's like this, this is why I would go. You know, <laughs> you know it's like I could find uh, somebody who can locate these uh, these materials for me. So that's in the negative sense. Uh, I think on uh, the more positive sense, because we're not purchasing like that, um, it forces us to think a bit more creatively about what's already present. 
um, what's already here. Um, and so one program that has helped us with that is uh, the GLAM Center for Collaborative Teaching and Learning um, here at the, the library. It, it's, ho it's housed in the library and it's a uh, consortium of uh, Spelman College, uh, Clark Atlanta University and the, the uh, AUC Woodruff Library and our art, art collections as well as our archival collections. And really what we're able to do with that is we have a lot of digitized material, thousands and thousands of pieces of digital material that we get to showcase in dynamic ways. Um, so we look at that backlog, uh, we use it in instruction, um, we've created uh, cool uh, digital humanities projects like we just uh, published a timeline on the history of drama and dance at Spelman since 1894. You know, it's, it's, that's the kind of thing that we probably would not have had as much time to put together had it not been for the, the diverted focus to, to move it here. So uh, yeah, I just think there's positives and, and negatives. The negative stuff is obvious, uh, but the positive things, it's, it's the creative outlook. Catherine, you have anything to add? Yeah, I, um, Cornell's shipping and receiving facilities have been closed along with the rest of Cornell's campus. So our purchasing of physical materials although not electronic resources, are paused until we have the ability to receive, distribute, and unpack orders safely again. So I didn't, I didn't respond to the poll because our situation doesn't quite match any of the options on there. Um, so once we're able to open again safely and our shipping room opens, I'm hoping that um, our funds will be unfrozen again. Um, and I, I think if these freezes are temporary for a few months, the long-term effects will be minimal, but um, temporary institutional budget freezes are probably understandable in a lot of places right now at a time when predicted losses for higher ed are gonna be in the billions um, and the future is so unclear. Um, but if the costs, the cost of a longer freeze, however, I think could be significant to the book and manuscript world as a whole, but also to the integrity of institutional collecting programs as, as um, Clinton was pointing out and the learning and research they support. We're all an ecosystem and institutional collecting supports not only the book trade, but students and scholars and public learning. Um, and in many cases defined communities to which we've made commitments for historical documentation and support. So abandoning those collecting programs will result results in long term gaps um, and you know, in our collections, but also potentially in the scholarly record, as well as risk losing the trust of our constituencies and supporters. So I hope and believe that, um, especially given the fact that many um, institutional budgets are fueled by income from restricted endowments, that collecting needs to be unfrozen with all reasonable precaution, of course, and with due consideration to individual institutional situations but as soon as feasible, because short-term wise can easily turn into, I think, long-term foolish. Great. Um, in the interest of time, I think we should probably go to the next question. And I'm just sharing the results of that poll. Um, briefly, if people want to take a screenshot um, or see it, just... Um, there you go. We can also share this poll, the poll results as part of our YouTube posting. So, all right. Um, moving on to our next question. Um, we want to think more um, and ask our panelists about outreach um, in particular. What are some of the more innovative ways that booksellers and curators have been reaching out to their audiences? Are there any strategies that stand out to you as being particularly savvy ethical or forward thinking. Um, and we've already heard how there have been some joint catalogs. Uh, we've also heard about people who are holding material uh, for clients until they can ship, um, speaking to Catherine's point. Um, Rob, do you wanna kick it off and address innovation, um, things that you've seen that, uh, that you find compelling? Well, you know, I like the idea of the joint catalogs. Heather, you've been involved in one with Justin and Simon, I think, and uh, there's McBride and Ken Sons and so and someone else who is doing it also. 
uh, I think that's a very uh, interesting concept and uh, hopefully it's all been successful for you. Uh, you know that I've been involved with the M&S books and uh, you know, every time any one of us issues a catalog, it's all a joint catalog because we all own part of it. Uh, one thing I just wanted to mention that's really not going to really answer the question, but it's uh, something that's happened in the trade, uh, I'd say over the last 10 or 15 years, is that there's been a real emphasis on selling books and manuscripts to libraries, and uh, there's been less focus on selling to uh, individuals. And I know people, uh, partners of mine actually, whose business is almost entirely uh, with institutions. And I sort of see that as a little bit of a mistake, putting all your eggs into one basket. I still think that I have 30 or 40% of my sales are private. And uh, I feel um, uh, blessed with that, uh, especially in these times. And I'm curious what the other booksellers, uh, Heather, uh, uh, or Victoria, what you might think about that. I'm sorry, I diverted from your no, question. That's okay. We'll build that in. Heather, um, want, do you want to speak to innovation and then also speak to this question of uh, clientele, institutional and private? Um, sure. Well, I mean, I would, uh, I would say, you know, in, in terms of innovation, I think that everyone, not just booksellers talking more to booksellers, but I think booksellers are talking more to librarians curators talking more to collectors. Like, I feel like there's just generally kind of a breaking down under this pressure of a lot of the walls that typically sort of divide people and make them feel like, oh no, this is my special, my special place where I only talk to the people who do my actual job. Um, and I think that can only be healthy, honestly. Um, I really uh, feel like we could do so much more together um, in terms of transforming the rare book world into the kind of place that so many of us would like to see, a more representative, inclusive, dynamic, diverse place. Um, and all the kinds of conversations that have come out of the past six weeks of us being stuck in our houses, unable to go to our offices, I think have been actually really to the good. And like Clint was saying, I feel like, you know, normal work will resume at some point, but maybe we can build on the sort of things we put in place during this period to, to get us through and, and keep us busy. Um, in terms of uh, collaboration, I did do a, a joint quarantine catalog early in, in April with Simon Beatty and Justin Croft and Ben Kinmont, and that was really fun. And now I just saw that um, the, the trio of uh, Johnson Rare Books and Archives and Kent Chance and um, McBride Rare Books have just put out their second and they've actually combined their collaborative efforts with a Zoom meeting um, where people can, can you know, log in and, uh, and actually see the bookseller in the bookseller's city holding up the books and talking about the books, which seems like a really fun, um, you know, and potentially promising, promising idea. So I just wanted to, to, uh, to get that in there. I mean, one thing we always talk about at CABS, as all the former CAB students on this call will recall, you know, it's just the importance of thinking about book selling not as a sprint, but as a marathon. It's not about having one sale or one customer or a good year. It's about constantly, constantly being aware and alert and responsive and pivoting to things, the changes that are always being thrown at you. This is a particularly big change. Definitely, I would say the biggest that I personally have had thrown at me in my, uh, in my career, but, um, but I still feel like a lot of those um, those reflexes are are there, and there's muscle memory there to see what what are people what do people need from you? How can you provide it? Um, and I think that uh, people certainly booksellers I know um, have been doing a lot more listening and a lot less pitching recently, as everyone around them is having to respond to new realities in real time. And I think that that's probably for the good. Thanks, Heather. Victoria, do you want to talk about? Uh, clientele, institutional, um, I'm guessing most of yours is private, but, um, and then talk about innovation that you've seen that suggests new paths forward uh, for curators and for booksellers alike. Yes, so uh, a very small percentage of our clientele is institutional and it's not usually intentional at all. We just get online orders and occasionally they're going to some library. Um, but yeah, most of our clientele is definitely private. Um, and um, I mean, one of the things I did learn a lot about at CABS that, you know, I was hoping to kind of branch out and learn more about was selling to institutions. Obviously, that's now going to be put on hold for a while. Um, 
as far as innovation, it's not uh, definitely not an original idea. It's not my idea, but as one of the millennials in the group, I will say social media works really well. Um, the mystery boxes we did, um, I think I posted about it one time, and then everyone who ordered from that initial order posted about it, and then their friends started ordering from us, and their friends, and I think I shipped out 75 mystery boxes or something in the last few weeks. So, um, you know, it's not a ton of money, but it, that's 75 individual private clients uh, who a lot of them, you know, sent us emails saying, what can I do to help? You know, um, it's really been nice to see these individual clients that we do have that we've been, you know, selling books to for decades who are reaching out to us in this time and, and kind of, you know, making sure that we're going to be around when this is all over. Um, so that has been kind of nice to see. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's not particularly innovative, but um, it, it definitely does. I should be using social media more than I do, definitely. And um, everyone's just sitting at home on their phones right now. So um, if you can remind them anyway, you know, that you're here and you're still selling books, uh, they'll, they'll probably reach out to you if you let them know. So. Thanks, Victoria. Um, Catherine, you want to speak about innovation? Um, I, don't, I don't think I have too much to add um, to what everyone's been saying. I, I just want to echo that, you know, yes to these new opportunities to collaborate and support each other and to listen more. And, you know, to that point, thank you so much to Rare Book School and to CABS and to you and Maria and all the teams that put sessions like this together. I think this is a great start and it would be great to have, um, I'm in, as I'm listening to everybody, having another replay of this particular event in six months and see where we are then might be really interesting and useful. I also just wanted to mention briefly that libraries are also seeking ways to connect with their communities more um, and their information needs. There have been examples of both public and research libraries making Wi-Fi hotspots available in parking lots, for example, or um, adjacent to their buildings or negotiating with vendors to temporarily open up resources previously behind paywalls in ways that um, are, are new and innovative. So that's, that's another thing that booksellers could potentially also take advantage of that a lot of things that they might have found in a university library website that were previously behind a paywall, you may, as you're, as you're chipping away at your cataloging backlogs, um, find more resources that are open, Excellent. even if temporarily. Thanks, Catherine. Clint, anything to add? Yeah, I'd say there's a there's a few things. Uh, the first is really uh, the forming of new um, uh, collecting areas. So for us, one thing that we've done, uh, the Archives Research Centers um, started documenting the AUC response to COVID-19, and it's it's already public. Um, we've had uh, many responses from students, professors um, uh, throughout the AUC, and it takes the form of uh, people sharing their stories uh, via text, um, uh, video, uh, uh, photographs, um, and I think what you get is not just their stories, but also you get some images of the different kinds of digital events, the flyers and things like that that have been going around. Um, and so we've gotten a great response to that. Um, and we're, we're really quite excited about where that's going. Um, another thing that we've done is we're kind of uh, taking uh, digital collections and uh, adding new ones each month. Um, so like every month you're, you're seeing new things come up and they're planned throughout the rest of the, the year. Um, our digital services department is just, uh, they're, they're killing it. I don't know what else to say. Um, and uh, I think uh, another thing that is really more uh, my job is networks. Um, so it's being a part of things like this, like, you know, with Rare Book School to share what we're doing, um, but also to share our collections. Um, uh, speaking with, to what Catherine just said about uh, libraries trying to engage with communities, uh, that's, that's my role. So I, I sit on editorial boards for journals that focus on themes related to us, like the Atlanta Studies um, editorial journal, um, editorial board rather. Um, and so anytime we can resources from the library that aid that digital journal, we want to do that. Um, 
there's uh, art projects um, around the city uh, that have curatorial committees. So uh, I try and sit on those so that we can provide uh, resources yet again. It's a, it's a way for us to be seen, even if, you know, like we're not, <laughs> we're not open, so to speak. Uh, so we, we take that idea of innovation uh, very seriously and it is very community uh, driven and it, it means a lot in terms of forming those relationships at times like this. Great. Thank you. Maria, yes. right to hand it over to you. Yes, we have uh, one final question. Um, the ABAA has an antiquarian bookseller as Benevolent Fund, which was founded in 1952 to benefit antiquarian booksellers in times of personal need. Meanwhile, some businesses and institutions have contingency funds and safety nets in place to help staffers weather hard times. Are there any additional steps that we can take as a community to help those who are in need right now? This is a hard question, I think. Well, uh, I'll start. Um, I'm not really sure uh, what additional steps, I haven't really thought of anything, but I, we've all heard of the Red Sox nation. And I believe there's a book selling nation uh, that we're all sort of in this together. And uh, I just want to tell a little story that goes back to a collection I bought about six or seven years ago. Uh, it was put together by a guy in Saigon during the war. And he was buying books from booksellers in Saigon. And he decided he needed more than what they had in Saigon. So somehow the booksellers in Saigon got in touch with the booksellers in Hanoi. And the booksellers in Hanoi shipped books down on the Hanoi Trail on bicycles to this man in Saigon. And I thought to myself, my God, there's this war going on. And what a story that is, that the booksellers were sticking together and they still had their little nation. And, uh, it, and meanwhile, everything else around them was in, in a mess. And I feel a little bit like that here. We see Heather uh, doing joint catalogs. Uh, we've got virtual book fairs coming out. We're all coming together. And I think it's gonna continue that way until the crisis is over. And when the crisis is over, I think we're all gonna be better for it. That's all. Heather, Victoria, anything you add? Um, you know, I, I would say um, just a quick note on the AVAA Benevolent Fund. Um, that is a fantastic fund, but it is strictly earmarked for personal, uh, you know, personal uh, crises, not for business crises. So, Unfortunately, a lot of the, the suffering that we're seeing right now, it, it's not the result of fire or flood or cancer or something like that. It's the result of a business downturn that is affecting everyone. So the benevolent fund would actually not come into play in that, in that circumstance. Um, I know from talking to a lot of local Brooklyn booksellers, like we all went after the PPP loan, um, which is largely forgivable. And I would say if you're a bookseller who's struggling, you should definitely look into applying for that during the second round. I think you have till June 30th to, you know, you can get a couple of months of expenses um, covered anyhow. So I would definitely do that. Um, and then like, like Rob was saying, I mean, we, we all want everyone to come out of this. And I think that we can work together, um, not just intellectually and you know, that way, but, but also financially. Partner with people who, uh, if you're able to do that with someone who is struggling or could really use the partnership. Um, if you have resources that you can devote to helping other people in this field, this is a good time to devote those resources. Um, even if those resources aren't cash, even if it's reputation or the ability to make an introduction, you know, think about looking out for other people and let's all get through this together, I guess, is what I would say. Um, as institutions, uh, do you think libraries have a hand to play in this or are they, uh, a bit too impersonal for the sort of application. Um, I one of the things that I've been trying to do only because Cornell's acquisitions are on pause is that I've been trying to connect dealers with private collectors in my network, 
or referred them to an other institution if I happen to know that library is still buying. If and when I notice things in a catalog um, that contain items of interest to those specific collectors or programs, because even though we're on pause, I, I have not stopped reading catalogs. Um, I still read all the catalogs that come across, well, no, not all of them, but many of them. And I've even started buying a few things with my own money because I can't use my institution's money of things at low value just because it's hard. It's a lifelong habit of, of spotting undervalued items that are a perfect fit for something, a collecting initiative or a scholar that you know is working on something or um, you know, just knowing as, as you've all been observing that we're all connected in this together and wanting everyone to come out through the other side. So those, those are just a couple of things that have happened in, in my practice. Um, good, Victoria, anything to add? Um, I, I can say that uh, in the AUC context, though we're definitely doing well um, and, and things look okay right now, it is a very tenuous uh, circumstance. And like I was saying before, uh, historically black colleges and universities really are affected greatly um, by downturns like this. Um, and so in order for um, uh, the library and for curators and institutions uh, like mine to continue to have these relationships uh, with dealers, um, uh, with antiquarian booksellers, it's it's something where uh, we we need to be solid as well. So we need the support of um, definitely alumni and definitely those people who use the resources. The more that people use the resources, uh, the the better our argument is <laughs> to for sustainability. Um, and also, you can donate to these kinds of institutions. Um, you can donate to ours. So I think it's really important that um, we we keep that in mind. Um, as uh, it's a it's an ecosystem <laughs> that and and we all share in it. Um, so yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, do you have anything else, Victoria? Um, not much. But um, yeah, I mean, like everyone else kind of said it's it's a tough time so there's not really much anyone can do but um you know i i think my best advice is just to be patient with everyone that you're dealing with and be kind to everyone that you're dealing with because anyone that can spend money right now um you want to keep them around and the ones who can't right now are going to be able to later so you want to do whatever you can to ensure that they're going to when the situation changes I mean, you know, after my, my boss passed away, with people coming in for like a year, giving us money that he had loaned to them when they were in, you know, some time of need and they couldn't afford dinner. And I'm not saying you should loan out cash by any means, but those people come back and they remember you and they remember what you helped them out in a time of need. And I really do think um, that it saved us in the past. So I'm kind of counting on save us again. That's really our only safety net. That's all I got. Good. Great. Well, I want to say thanks to all our panelists for their thoughts. This is the point of the discussion where we're going to open it up to live Q&A.